uh, in blue zones, they're not doing, there's no silver bullet for longevity. It's the sum of lots of little things. And what the blue zone challenge does is give you those little things uh, that should add up to weight loss and longevity gain uh, in, in a very short time. I'm Rip Esselstyn, and welcome to the Plan Strong podcast. The mission at Plan Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plan Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. Hello, Plant Strong people. I cannot believe that we're almost halfway into December and we're winding down 2021. It just seems absolutely surreal to me how fast the time has flown by. I'm Rip Esselstyn. Welcome to another episode of the Plant Strong Podcast. Man, we got a fabulous guest today. This is his second appearance on the Plant Strong Podcast. And I'm just going to start by saying we all need a little nudge sometimes in order to like kick ourselves into gear, to get motivated to move, and to make some long term sustainable healthy changes. Today, I'm going to give you that nudge, along with Mr. Blue Zones himself, Dan Butner. He's a researcher, explorer, world record holder. He's become a good friend, and he's author of the new book, The Blue Zones Challenge, which is the latest in his series of Blue Zones books, inspired by his research discovering the world's longest living people. This new book, it's gorgeous and includes all kinds of tips and tricks from the five blue zones. And these are locations around the world where people consistently live to 100 and beyond. And I'm going to give you a little trick right now. It's an acronym. So you always remember the five locations and impress your, your friends and family at parties. So the acronym is LIONS, L-I-O-N-S. The L stands for Loma Linda here in the United States. The I is Akaria, Greece. The O is Okinawa, Japan. The N is Nicoya, which is in the uh, peninsula of Costa Rica. And the S is Sardinia, Italy. There you have it. You'll never forget them. Now, the Blue Zones Challenge, it's all about helping you to get set up for success so that the healthy choice becomes your natural, easy choice. And it's all about changing your surroundings so this is the case. We're talking about simple changes and advice for changing up your kitchen, your pantry, your work environment, and even how to improve your social network and your sense of purpose, because we all know that People with a strong sense of purpose are more likely to stay active, engage their brains, and live a longer, healthier life. Dan, he's making the rounds this week, the interview rounds. So I was honored to have him with me today to introduce his new work into the universe and to give you that nudge to kickstart your journey to happiness and longevity in a sustainable way by reshaping your surroundings. Before we dive in with Dan, the holidays are here, and it's the perfect time to gift wrap the good news about following a whole food, plant-strong lifestyle. I wanna give you some gift ideas to help you introduce the science and inspire a friend or family member to eat more plants. First, you guys all are aware that I've written a bunch of books. Now, books are sometimes the easiest entry point for people interested in learning more. Now, the four books are The Engine 2 Diet, my first book that came out in 2009. Then I wrote the um, Plant Strong, right? The World's Healthiest Diet. 
and that came out in 2013. Then in 2017, I wrote The Engine 2 Seven Day Rescue Diet. And finally in 2018 with my sister Jane, The Engine 2 Cookbook. Each one is packed with digestible science and bundled with delicious recipes and lots of great success stories. You can visit Amazon or PlanStrong.com to learn more or to send a book to someone that you love. Now, secondly, a gift membership to the Plan Strong Meal Planner is incredibly thoughtful. It includes 12 months of access to curated recipes, live support from our meal planning team, personalized meal recommendations that you can customize, adaptive grocery lists, and optional grocery delivery via Amazon Fresh, Instacart, or Peapod. And the great news, for the month of December, we have gift cards that are on sale for 20 bucks off. And you can just simply visit mealplanner.planstrong.com to, to learn more. Now, finally, having simple ready-to-eat meals on hand is a true lifesaver, especially if the loved one doesn't feel like cooking or lives alone. Our all-new Plan Strong chilies and stews are delicious, nourishing, and a wonderfully thoughtful gift. They're available online. You can send one of our sampler packs today and give the gift of convenience. Visit PlanStrongFoods.com. Okay, let's dive in with Dan and the Blue Zones. Hey, hey, Plant Strong, um, Plant Strong people. I'm here with God, Dan Butner of all the <laughs> wonderful people in the world. Love this man, love his work. Dan, if I'm not mistaken, the last time that I saw you, we were playing pickleball in the Texas. That's Kentucky. right. <laughs> That's right. And we had, a, we had a lot of fun camping and eating Plant Strong food and, and exercising. That's right. Um, I've, but and since I and since I last saw you, I think you made the exodus from like Los Angeles to Miami, along with Brian Wendell and uh, Robbie Barbero. Is there yes. something going on that I should know about? Yeah, well, there. Uh, this is what's going on right here. Oh, 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 oh Jiminy Christmas! <laughs> <laughs> That's what's going on. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say no more. <laughs> uh, well, this is a big day for you because today is your publication date for the Blue Zones Challenge. This, I got to say, Dan, I just got this flexi-bound copy right here. It is, you guys have the best branding, the best Pantones. My favorite color is blue. You guys always rock it out. So tell me, and you know, all the Plant Strong people that are listening, um, is this kind of a great way for people to incorporate the blue zones into, into their life? Why the challenge and why now? Yes. So, you know, the idea behind blue zones was to reverse engineer longevity. It was a, a big project with the National Institutes on Aging and with National Geographic. And we really spent a long time identifying these five populations around the world, so-called blue zones, where people are living statistically longest. And then several more years after confirming them, finding out exactly what these people do. And you know, of course, a big reason they're living a, up to a dozen years longer than the rest of us is because they're eating mostly a whole food plant-based diet, mostly. Uh, they do, they have traditionally a little bit of animal products, but you know, really peasant foods uh, mm -hmm. made to taste delicious have fueled them. Um, they're moving naturally. Uh, uh, every 20 minutes or so, they have a strong sense of purpose, strong family. Uh, these are the things we all know add to longevity. But the reason that they're getting all these good years without developing type 2 diabetes and heart disease and many types of cancer and even dementia. We have one blue zone in Ecadia where there's almost no dementia at all among a population of 10,000 people. It's not because these people have better... Uh, discipline or better self-control or, or they're somehow, you know, morally better people, better genes or something. They just live in environments that make the healthy choice, the easy choice. And what this book, the blue zone challenge does is it takes 30 or so evidence-based nudges and defaults 
that help you set up your social life, your home life, your kitchen, your bedroom, your work life, uh, and to a certain extent, your internal life. So the, the healthy, healthy choice is unconscious. And there's where the big opportunity is. So we're not trying to engineer your conscious choice. We're trying to engineer your unconscious choice so you're set up for success. And this has worked in five places around the world. It's worse, worked in our 50 or so Blue Zone project cities. And now for the first time in 20 years, I really put the work into making sure it's a manual that can work for individuals who tried everything else. And this New Year's, instead of thinking that uh, uh, finally another diet's going to work for you, uh, instead of trying to change your behavior, uh, probably time now to let me help you change your surroundings and set you set yourself up for success. So you just said change your surroundings. So help me out here. What's the difference between changing your surroundings as opposed to changing your environment? And same know, thing. Same so, thing. Okay. Okay. Same thing. Okay. So change your surroundings. And I know in the acknowledgement you acknowledge two very important people that helped you realize that uh, how important it was to change your surroundings. That's Pekka Puska and Stam Stamatis Moriatis. Can you tell us about those two people and how they influenced you? Yes. Yeah, so Stamatis Moriatis is a, a, a Greek guy. I wrote a story uh, in the New York Times Sunday Magazine and about him. He the, from the, the name of this, the article was The Island Where People Forgot to Die. And he traveled to from Mikadia, one of our blue zones, to America when he was a young man. Uh, he started living an American lifestyle. At age 66, he found himself um, with a terminal case of cancer. And instead of going on chemotherapy and taking a bunch of pills, he moved back to Ikaria, where he lived for another 40 years. And he got back, he started eating the plant-based Mediterranean diet, uh, drinking clean water, clean air, connecting with his religion, connecting with his social network. And I can't tell you for sure that it was in his environment that enabled him to make it to 102. But he was our poster boy because on his island, you have eight extra years of life expectancy and no dementia. And that's not because they're better people. It's just because they live in a better environment. The other guy, Pekka Puska, uh, he ran a project in North Karelia, Finland, back in the 1970s. In the 1970s, North Karelia, Finland had the highest rate of cardiovascular disease in the world. Yeah. Uh, these people were eating dairy. They, you know, they would fry their cheese and butter. And the national dish was this sort of pork stew that had three ingredients, water, pork, and salt. And if you want it spicy, you added more salt. <laughs> so it wasn't a shock that men were dropping dead at age 55. Pakapushka came in and he had the insight that instead of trying to hound people to stop eating their sausages or their pork or their dairy uh, or their, their butter, he just uh, brought in canola oil and uh, helped worked with the uh, local universities to create a rapeseed canola oil that people could afford. Um, he, uh, people generally didn't eat berries because they couldn't afford them. They had no access. He, uh, uh, blueberries and, and raspberries grew in, in, uh, in abundance in Northern Finland. And he helped make sure they found distribution in grocery stores and in restaurants, and people's homes. Uh, he, yeah, engineered out some of the fat and salt in the sausages and replaced it with a uh, cheap mushroom filler, thereby lowering the uh, you know, animal uh, product consumption and sodium consumption. So again, instead of trying to change very firmly rooted cultural norms, yeah. he changed the surroundings. So people mindlessly made better decisions. And lo and behold, uh, uh, the the rate of cardiovascular disease dropped seventy yeah. percent in the last thirty years, and they've maintained it. So not because he sold some fad diet mm. or some snake oil superfood, uh, whole food, plant based. Yeah, uh, that those those numbers are absolutely crazy. And in the book, you also mention a great quote. I, I love Winston Churchill, and you mention him. He says. 
shape your surroundings and they will shape you, um, which I really like. I also like when he says, America always gets it right, but only after they've tried everything else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so true. Yeah. So you, you talk about nudges uh, in this fantastic book. What, um, can you give me some example of some nudges that some of our listeners can like start thinking about? Yeah. So in your kitchen, um, I, I like to say most of us are on what I call a seafood diet. We tend to eat the food we see and, and Cornell food lab has really done the best research on this. So, um, if you have chips on your counter, you know, with a clip or a toaster, after about two years, you weigh about six more pounds than the same people who have no toaster, no chips on their counter. Um, if you have a candy jar within arm's reach, you weigh about four more pounds after two years. So replacing those negative nudges with a positive nudge with, say, uh, a fruit bowl, which you keep full on your counter, you're way more likely to eat that fruit. And establishing a junk food drawer you know, a lot of us are going to bring salty snacks and, you know, sugar, packaged sugar. I know you're not, but a lot of other uh, of us, are, um, uh, we, we have cheat foods and, um, you know, it's not a sin to have them in your house, but put them out of the way. Uh, the other nudge is a TV set. Mm. We know that if you have a, if you're eating, if you're watching TV while eating your meal, you tend to eat to your show. <laughs> and you stop eating when your show's over. There's good research behind it. No. So taking show, taking the TV out of your uh, kitchen occasions, losing a couple pounds a year, uh, eating off of 10 inch plates as opposed to 14 inch plates. We know you perceive if you're eating off the 10 inch plate, you perceive a bigger helping of food and you tend to eat less. So these are all mindless things you can set up in a few minutes and you will mindlessly have better food behaviors. And uh, in blue zones, they're not doing, there's no silver bullet for longevity. It's the sum of lots of little things. And what the blue zone challenge does is give you those little things uh, that should add up to weight loss and longevity gain uh, in, in a very short time. Yeah. Which is what everybody wants and to make that sustainable. Uh, you, you say in the book, I think you even, even started out, it might be the, in the first page that if you're overweight, if you have diabetes, if you're suffering from heart disease, if you've had a shot across the bow with cancer, it's not your fault. And, um, yeah. and, then, and then, you know, I think shortly thereafter to support that, you say like in 1960, we had 100 McDonald's. And then today we have over 250,000 fast food restaurants, just as an example. That's right. You know, in, in 1980, and most of us are, were around 1980, only 15% of Americans were obese. Today, we're over 45%. So mm. threefold gross in obe uh, uh, increase in obese people. Uh, the diabetes and prediabetes rate is up about sevenfold. That's not because we are lesser humans than we were in 1980. It's not because we have less discipline and less self-control. Our environment has changed. In addition to the proliferation of fast food restaurants, most of which just serve junk, um, then over 55% of all retail outlets, from the place you get your tires changed to the place you buy your diabetes medicines, <laughs> force you route you through a gauntlet of sugar, cereal, sugar, uh, sweet beverages, through uh, uh, sweets, through. Uh, salty, uh, sh salty snacks. And we're genetically hardwired to crave sugar and salt and fat. And we evolved this environment of scarcity and hardship. And now we're in this environment where you can't take five steps without being confronted by something. And eventually your discipline is going to wear down. And we're an obese, uh, overweight nation, not because uh, Americans are bad people. It's because we have just let the food environment we, we live in get out of control. Yeah. You, um, you, one of the things you also talk about in the book is how almost, I think it's one in five of us have less than three friends, three good friends, and, um, and just how lonely um, we have become. 
And there's something that you learned, I think it was from the Okinawans called Moai. Can you, can you talk yes. about that and how you incorporate that into the challenge? Yes. Yes. So if you, if you are one of the lonely people who don't have at least three friends you can count on on a bad day, that, that's the technical definition of loneliness. It shaves about eight years off your life expectancy. It's as bad for you as a smoking habit. We don't live in a culture where there's any guarantees that we're going to have a supportive social circle. Uh, one of the neat things I, I observed in Okinawa was the concept of a moai. And this is a committed social circle, uh, usually half a dozen friends. Um, and they often uh, are formed by their parents. So you, kids, when they're five years old, they're put in this moai and they're expected to travel through life. And if things go well, if you um, if you get a raise or there's a good crop, you're expected to share it. And conversely, if if a parent dies or a child gets sick or you get divorced or you run out, you need you need to borrow some money for seed or whatever. You have this circle of friends who are going to support you. And um, I got to sit with uh, five, five members of a Moai. Uh, they were. Uh, uh, 102 year old women who'd been friends for 97 years. And it was a beautiful and powerful thing. And you could see how this social circle uh, really favored their longevity because they were checking out, they were checking in with each other every night. They got together, drank a little sake. Um, um, they uh, gossiped. Um, they maybe shared some, um, uh, a, a meal, which, you know, in, in Okinawa, it's almost always a tofu stir fry. So they reinforce the right behaviors for the decades uh, that get them to their, into their hundreds. Yeah. Do you have a Moai that you are part of that helps keep you uh, kind of social? <laughs> yeah, I do. You know, I would, I would say, Rip, actually, you're part of my extended Moai, but uh, you know, John Mackey, who are both friends of ours and, and, um, this whole plant-based world, uh, Robbie yeah. Barbero and, and um, these people who have really um, had the epiphany that the way to a, a healthier and happier America is through eating whole plant-based. These are the people I, I tend to socialize with and play a lot of pickleball with them. And, <laughs> and um, you know, we share values, we share interests, we share passions, and uh, we really look out for each other. Yeah. So one of the things that I think is so prevalent right now in this country is how sedentary we are. And you talk about the blue zones and how these people, they move naturally. What are some, some ways that you suggest people who need to move more? What are some nudges that we can do to move more naturally? Right. I, well, first of all, don't get obsessed with exercise because exercise has been an unmitigated public health failure. Uh, fewer than 15% of Americans get the minimum recommended amount of physical activity, which is 30 minutes of walking a day. Uh, and we keep beating this dead horse. In blue zones, it's very clear that they're moving every 20 minutes uh, because they're nudged into it. They, every time they go to work or a friend's house or out to eat, it occasions to walk. Um, their houses aren't full of mechanical conveniences to do their kitchen work for them or their yard work or their house work for them. They have gardens out back. Um, they, moving every 20 minutes or so, uh, easy on the joints. Uh, they're burning more calories than they would if they sat at their desk all day long and uh, thought they were making it up at the gym. If you look at the data on gym usage, people are members of gyms. They use it fewer than five times a month. So that's mm -hmm. not really working. And their metabolism's uh, um, higher. So, uh, you know, a few nudges that work. Um, having a comfortable pair of walking shoes by your door. Uh, having a bicycle that works. Uh, learning how to get to work by taking a bus. People kind of roll their eyes, but there's actually good research that shows that people who take a bus to work have about 20% lower rate of cardiovascular mortality because they're walking from their house to the bus stop, the bus stop to work and doing that reverse 10 times a week. And it's a long-term daily stuff that's going to get us uh, to a healthy age, 70 or 80 or 90. Not this folly that, okay, I'm going to run a marathon this year and somehow that's going to do it. Yeah. And, well, you know, Rip, you, you and I are both ultra distance and, you know, high performing athletes. And, you know, 
uh, we've done that. And these days, you know, I, I ride my bike and play pickleball. <laughs> That's right. And I feel better than I ever have. I, I, I know. And one of the things too, that you talk about in the book that I really like is I think you talked about how a lot of these Okinawan uh, elders, they don't have chairs or couches. They just sit on the floor. And so they, they have to get up off the floor, what, a hundred times a day? Well, it might not be that many, but <laughs> 20 or 30 for sure. And yeah. so this was actually my observation, but at a certain age, falling down, if you're over age 50 and you fall down and break a hip, there's a 25% chance you'll be dead within a year. Very high mortality rate. Part of the reason Okinawa has the longest lived people in the history of the world uh, is because their incidence of falls is so low. Probably one-fifth the, the number of falls that Americans have, uh, fatal falls. So you start asking yourself, well, why is that? And you look around at their house, and indeed, they do have, uh, they sit on the floor. So they're not only getting up and down, uh, that means lower body strength. It means lower body flexibility. Yeah. It means they don't have furniture to trip over. Um, so once again, it, it uh, loops back to my central argument that if you want to live longer, pay attention not to trying to change your behavior, change your environment, mm -hmm. shape your surroundings. You, you kind of touched upon this earlier, but I, I love saying the word and I'd love for you to just talk a little bit more mm -hmm. about it. And that's Hara Hachi Bu. Am I pronouncing it correctly? You are. Okay. What, what, in the world, what, have, what in the world is that? And why should our listeners pay attention to that? Hara Hachi Bu is a Confucian adage, uh, goes back about 2,500 years. And it reminds Okinawans, they'll say it like a prayer before a meal. And uh, it reminds them to stop eating when their stomachs are 80% full. And I, you know, I, most of that, quite honestly, is manifested at the counter. So they'll typically portion out 80% uh, of the calories and they'll put their leftovers away before the meal instead of putting them away after the meal when you've eaten too much. Um, but it, it's also that reminder that, you know, if you, if, to slow down, um, to enjoy the meal. And when you slow down, there's a better chance that that, that sig that fullness feeling uh, uh, has a chance to travel up the brain to tell you to stop eating. There's usually about a 20 minute delay between the time our bellies are full and our brains register it. So if you're eating too fast, uh, you're more likely to overeat than if you uh, slow down. I think, um, you know, in the West here, I think saying grace is a really great idea because it puts some punctuation between our busy lives mm -hmm. and uh, uh, our meals. It, um, it reminds us that, you know, food is often, it's traditionally been hard won and it shouldn't just be wolfed down. And um, it, uh, it just sets the tone of a slower meal. Yeah. And again, it's one of the subtle things that probably is occasioning longevity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of good research to show a little bit of calorie restriction goes a long way. You have a lot of, I mean, again, in, in going through this book, I love how you have all these workbook activities, journaling. Um, and one of the things that you talk about that's, I think, pretty important is like living your purpose. Can you address that and, and how important that is? Yeah, so the first director of the National Institutes on Aging, Dr. Robert Butler, did this landmark study uh, examining people's writings and found that people who could, who could articulate their sense of purpose were living about seven years longer than people who were rudderless in life. Mm. And along those same lines, in Blue Zones, people have actually vocabulary for purpose, ikigai or in, coast, in Okinawa or Costa Rica's uh, plan de vida. So, Rather than just glossing over purpose uh, and its power, uh, in the Blue Zone Challenge, I really try to take people through an internal inventory. Uh, I believe purpose is the cross-section of knowing your values, knowing your skills and what you do well and your passions, and most importantly, is having an outlet for them. It's putting your gifts or your or your abilities to work. I, I don't have much uh, confidence in 
you know, having purpose and not leaving the TV. Um, it's really when that purpose is put to work through volunteerism or um, through helping your family or helping your friends or, or contributing to uh, the community where that purpose, I think, really makes a difference. How does that add to longevity? People with a strong sense of purpose are more likely to stay active. They're more likely to take their meds and they're more likely to engage their brain. And we just see it's so clear in blue zones, people with purpose live longer. Yeah. The other thing that we really haven't talked about, I mean, you said it at the top of the, the show about, you know, being predominantly plant-based, but you have four always foods that you kind of suggest and four to avoid foods. You want to quickly go through those? Sure. And I recommend that people put this on a post-it note or post it on the refrigerator so they see it every day. So the four always foods, uh, uh, fruit that you like, because um, you'll eat it, beans. We know that people who eat a cup of beans a day eat, uh, live about four years longer than people who aren't eating beans. I recommend an Instant Pot and doing it yourself in a delicious recipe, but you can eat it out of the cans. Um, sweet potatoes. Uh, in Okinawa, uh, 70% of the dietary intake in, uh, until about 1970 were sweet potatoes, the, the, the powerful food. And then nuts. Nuts is your go-to snack. People eat a handful of nuts, live about two years longer than people who don't eat nuts. Can I interrupt um, you just for a second, just say in, to the listener, I think it's really important that in you in the book, you say a handful of nuts a day. So be and, and maybe not to like have five or six handfuls of nuts, but one handful because they're such, that's right. You know, calorie. Dense. Yeah. A lot of oil in those nuts. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, and then what about then to the avoid? Food, yeah. Avoid. Okay. So the number one source of refined sugar in the American diet is soda pop. I never bring that. I, I'd never bring that. There's, there's no redeeming quality to soda pop in my opinion. It should never be brought to hell. Uh, number two, um, uh, processed meats, and that, those, that's your hot dogs and your lunch meats and your bacon. Uh, World Health Organization puts those in the same uh, uh, category as, as cigarettes as a known carcinogen. Um, mm -hmm. Number three is uh, packaged sweets. Uh, it's not to say you can't enjoy sweets once in a while, but I'd argue just make, make, make yourself go outside to have those sweets. And then salty snacks, especially potato chips, are most highly correlated for obesity. Um, it turns out that you're, you know, too much salt and too much fat, your body actually makes fructose. And um, so it makes sugar. Uh, but um, uh, we don't know 100% why salty snacks uh, seem to make people fat. There's lots of, of uh, theories. But again, if you want to enjoy a small bag of chips once in a while, um, you have every right to treat yourself, but just don't have them in your house. <laughs> um, we, we just got Dan a, a cat. We named the cat pickles. <laughs> We've had pickles for <laughs> four months. It's a black cat. And we also have a dog, but I'm wondering, um, if you've in your, in your research with the, the blue zones, have you found any correlation with, um, Pets? Should, should we have pets? Is that, is that help us live longer, happier lives? I've only seen it in the research in dogs. People who own dogs tend to have about uh, half the rate of obesity than non-dog owners. And it's probably because that uh, if you uh, own a dog, the dog gets walked every day and therefore so does the human. You know, it's, <laughs> again, it's one of these great ways to yeah shape your home environment. So you're nudged into moving. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, Dan, <clears throat> so this, this is out the blue zones challenge, uh, a four week plan for longer, better life. What is this? Is this your fourth or fifth book or sixth book? Do you yeah, know? I think it's my, it's well, I hope it's, it'll be my fifth New York times bestseller. We'll see this week, but uh, it's out this week. It's already a bestseller on Amazon. Yeah. Um, but it really represents 20 years of work. And I think it's for as far as for individuals who want to put this to work in their life, um, it's the easiest. It's not a big intimidating book. It's interactive. Yeah. 
It'll help you go plant-based. Um, you know, about 80 million people on January 1st will start their New Year's resolution. And research shows by the first week in February, 80% of those will have forgot what the resolutions were. Um, this book doesn't ask you to change your behavior. It, it takes you to take that four weeks, set up your environment, and that should uh, exert an effect for decades. Uh, it's time to come out uh, before the holidays so you can give the gift of life. It's an inexpensive book. It's available on Amazon, and um, I, I'm very proud of it. Yeah, well, you should be. You really should be. I loved, uh, I loved reading it the last two days. Tell me, before I let you go to your next interview, um, what's the next exciting thing that you got going on? Is there a place you're traveling to or something you're looking forward to? Yes. Well, you know, I'm finding actually, I'm working on a book right now about uh, the American diet. You know, standard American diet is probably the most lethal thing that anybody's invented ever. But if you go about 100 years, old, 100 years back and you look at certain ethnicities in America 100 years ago, you find essentially a blue zone diet. So I'm working again with National Geographic to capture those ethnic American diets. And I'll be making the argument that actually there's an American diet that's the healthiest diet in the world. Oh. We've just forgotten it. Oh, it's brilliant. Brilliant. What a, <laughs> what a partnership you've had with, with uh, National Geographic. That's so beautiful. Man. We well, Dan, we, I appreciate your time today. Uh, congrats on getting another fantastic uh, book out into the universe, The Blue Zones Challenge. Um, you are something else. Appreciate Rip, it. You are too. I appreciate you. And I, I consider you a brother and, and uh, if I can ever help, let me know. And thank you for all the good you do in the world and, and um, look forward to many, many years of collaboration. Yes. Thank you. Plant strong. <laughs> Plant strong. Boom. Boom. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Dan's new book, the blue zones challenge is out now. And I think you'll benefit from the lessons and nudges in his book. For details on the book and all of the episode resources, visit the episode page at plantstrongpodcast.com. I'll see you next week with a little holiday snackables episode with two of my favorite women in the whole wide world, my mother, Anne Kryle Esselstyn, and my sister, Jane Halley Esselstyn. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Ann Kryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.